previous video we looked at the evidence for evolution. Today we're going to talk a little bit about evolutionary mechanisms, the things that help evolution to take place. Just a quick recap of the definitions of species and population. So a species is a group of organisms of the same type that are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Uh, whereas a population is a community of organisms of the same species in which interbreeding occurs. So we can talk about the Cape Town population of sparrows versus the Joburg population of sparrows. They are not able to interbreed because they cannot fly that distance. However, they are the same species. If you remember when we did variation and sources of variation, mutations, meiosis, chance fertilization and random mating, those are our sources of variation. Those sources of variation obviously help when it comes to increasing variation, when it comes to uh, having something that natural selection can act upon, and therefore they are contributing factors to evolution. If you have a mutation that occurs, you might end up with an adaptation that makes you more uh, suited to the environment. So if you think about that family in Germany, who have an, a, a gene that makes them immune to HIV, that is a mutation that they already have. Natural selection can then act upon that. So in an environment in which HIV is prevalent, that family would survive. They would reproduce, they would have lots of children and offspring, their children would not get HIV because they have this adaptation and therefore they would survive. That is the way that evolution works. So there has to be variation in order for natural selection to, to take place. Where there is no variation, natural selection will still take place, but then you can wind up with an extinction occurring. When we look at variation, there are two main types of variation. There is what's known as continuous variation and discontinuous variation. Continuous variation is where there are no intermediates. So if you think about height, if we were to take everybody in the school and line them up from the shortest person to the tallest person, that would be a continuous variation. When we're looking at things like eye color or blood type, those are discrete units. Your eyes are either blue or they are green or they are hazel, for example. Now, the way that we draw these things is different. So when you have continuous variation... In general, what you're looking at there is a polygenic trait, a trait that is coded for by more than one gene, in which each of those traits has multiple alleles. With uh, polygenic traits, the environment can often act upon those, so the environment will cause a change. So if you think of your skin color, your skin color is coded for by four different genes, each of which has, no, I lie, eight different genes, each of which has two variations. Um, and then you've got the environment playing a, a role as well. So it actually doesn't matter what your skin color is. When you go out into the sun, you're going to end up getting darker. So that is an example of continuous variation. When we have continuous variation, we always draw that as a line graph or as a histogram. Remember, a histogram is a bar graph with no spaces between the bars. Now, the interesting thing about continuous variation is that however small you make your increments on your graph, you will still have intermediates. So if we were to uh, do a graph of height and we made that height uh, that it was a one centimeter difference every time and every bar in our histogram was one centimeter bigger, you could reduce that to half a centimeter and you would still have bars at every point. You could reduce it to a quarter centimeter and you would still have bars at every point. So there would still be intermediates no matter how small you made your increments. So this is what the graph would look like, um, something like this. We call this a bell curve. It's narrow at either end, and the majority of the individuals have the median values. So if we look, these are your median values over here, and the majority of the people are sitting in that median value. You have a few people who are very, very short. You have a few people who are very, very tall, but the majority of people are average. That is a bell curve. Discontinuous variation is where you have discrete units or discrete categories or discrete values. It can occur in polygenic traits, but if it does, then you will only have two or maybe three genes that are involved, and each of them will only have a minimum, uh, will only have a maximum of two alleles. It is not affected by the environment in any way. It cannot be changed by the environment. This is the simplest form of variation that is not the most common form. The most common form of variation is actually continuous. When you draw discontinuous variation, you always draw it as a bar graph. So if we look at blood groups, you are either blood group A or B 
or A, B or O. There's no other variation in between. You can't be in the middle here, for example, of A and B. You can't be in the middle there, for example, between A, B and O. These are discrete units. So that is discontinuous variation. So if we look at this lovely graph of this uh, American band, the girls are all in white, the boys are all in blue, um, and you can see that they've been measured out in, according to their height. This is obviously in feet and inches because it's American. Uh, so you can see the shortest group of people there are five feet, no inches. The tallest people are six foot and five, uh, six foot uh, five inches. And you can see the graph that they draw here. Now, is this continuous or discontinuous variation? Okay, if you were listening, height is always a continuous variation. This graph is a continuous variation. What is interesting to notice is that the girls, most of the girls are small. You've got a few girls that are quite tall. Most of the boys are on the taller end of the spectrum. You've got a few boys that are quite short. If we were to count the number of boys and the number of girls and uh, have that distribution, then it would be discontinuous because you're either a boy or you're a girl. But when we look at height, that height is continuous variation. If we were just to draw the height of the girls, it would still be continuous variation because you've still got a range from short to tall. Likewise for the boys from short to tall. So this is continuous variation. When, we, when you're faced with a graph, uh, it's very easy to see whether it's continuous or discontinuous. If it is discontinuous, you will see spaces in between with discrete units. So this here, this is one gene for which there are only two alleles. You're either small or you're long, well, short and long. For here, I did say to you there are some examples of discontinuous variation where you have a polygenic trait. So here we have two loci, in other words, two genes taking place, and each of them has two alleles. And depending on which allele you get for which gene will determine whether you have a small, medium, or large beak. D clear, discrete units. There would be no beak sizes in between here and here. However, if beak size is a polygenic trait with six different genes, each of which has two alleles, then in the same way that for skin color in human beings, you would get this range, this variation um, of beak size. And in fact, if you were to make your increments in between each of these smaller, you would be able to spread that curve out, but it would still be a bell curve. Notice the bell curve. So that can either be drawn as bars or it can just be drawn as a line graph. Here, for example, we've got not just many, not just six genes, but many genes, so more than six genes, each of which has two alleles. Again, you end up with this line graph here. That would be continuous variation. So you can't just say, oh, beak size is discontinuous or beak size is continuous. You need to actually look at the variation that occurs within that characteristic, within that phenotype. So in these examples of that phenotype, it is discontinuous. You have significant gaps between with no intermediaries. In these two examples of beak size in this species, uh, it is continuous because you have lots of genes, polygenic trait, uh, giving you this wide variety in which there are lots of intermediaries. So now when we look at natural selection, and that's going to be in the next video, we're actually going to look at what natural selection is. But in this video, how does natural selection change our variation? So how does it act on either continuous or discontinuous data? So if you look here, the red is what happens after natural selection has taken place. So if you look at, in the first one, stabilizing selection, that is where whatever happens in terms of uh, the characteristic that you're looking at, the two extremes are selected against. In other words, if you have those two extremes, if you've got that phenotype, whatever it might be, you are more likely to die, you're more likely to be captured or, pre or preyed upon, you will not survive. Meaning that over time, that population will shift towards the middle. That is called stabilizing selection. With directional selection, you're looking at continuous variation where there are a variety of forms and one end is selected against. So it's not both ends, 
just one end is selected against. So if we look at this example here of the peppered moth, this was the original population. In this original population, you had light versions, medium versions, and dark versions. However, during the Industrial Revolution, the pollution from the various factories, the soot from that pollution, the, the sort of ash of that pollution, ended up on tree bark. With the result, the tree bark became much darker. And so therefore, all of the lighter versions of this moth were no longer camouflaged and they could be predated upon. With the result that this whole curve shifted to the right. Notice that in the new one, in this red one, you still have lighter versions, darker versions, and very dark version, uh, versions. So there is still variation in the species. It's just that that variation has shifted towards the darker end of the spectrum. Diversifying or destabilizing selection. That is where if you are in the middle of the population, so you're looking at this continuous variation and you're in the middle, you end up having a discontinuous variation occurring. So, for example, the example given here, if you have a range of colors of rabbits, ranging from the dark on this end, to light in the middle, to piebald on the right, in that environment, um, if you are dark or if you are piebald, you are better camouflaged. If you are the pure white bunny in the middle, you are more exposed, you're not well camouflaged, you're more likely to be predated upon. So we start off with a continuous variation, like this, and we end up with something that is more like a discontinuous variation. Now it's not discontinuous because notice this red line here is continuous, it doesn't stop. So you still have examples of pure white bunnies over here. You just have fewer of them. Here, you had very few of the dark bunnies. Here, you had very few of the piebald bunnies. Now you have lots of dark bunnies, lots of piebald bunnies. So it's still continuous variation, but it's more like, it's becoming more like discontinuous where you have either black or piebald and nothing in the middle. Um, if that selective pressure were to continue, that is eventually where this uh, evolutionary trend would go, is that eventually uh, you may well lose all of the white bunnies in the middle and you would then either be dark or you would be piebald. Uh, so if that selective, if that destabilizing or diversifying selection pressure continued, you may well end up going from continuous variation to discontinuous variation. So just to kind of recap this, directional selection it selects for one extreme trait. It could be this end or it could be that end, it depends. Here's another example. If you are a little gecko with a tail, the longer your tail is, the tail looks like a snake. Um, predators are more likely to leave you alone because they think your tail is a snake. So therefore you get pushed this way. So if that short, medium, long, the short ones are more likely to be predated upon. The medium ones, nah, they might survive. The long ones are very, are very definitely going to survive because this longer tail looks like a snake. And so the selective pressure pushes the population this way. And so you have, this is a gene shift. For stabilizing selection, that is where you are selecting for the moderate trait, for the median trait, the middle one. So here, if you are a cat, if you've got a short tail, you can't balance properly. If you've got a long tail, you can't balance properly. And therefore, a medium tail is what is being selected for. So the short ones won't be able to catch food. The long-tailed ones won't be able to catch food. But all the ones in the middle will be able to catch food more easily. And therefore, they are more likely to survive. So it pushes your population size in. It gets rid of these alleles. Disruptive selection. So if you're a squirrel with a short tail, um, you've got nothing that a cat or something else ca can clamp onto and catch you, so you're less likely to be caught. If you have a long tail, that is very good for helping you with balance when you're uh, bouncing from branch to branch in the trees. If you're in the middle, where you have a medium length uh, tail, you don't get the benefit in terms of balance in the tree. You've got a longer tail, which means predators are more likely to catch you. And so you are selected against. So here, for, for the disruptive or the diversifying selection, it is selecting against the moderate one. Okay, so stabilizing, we're selecting for the moderate one. 
disruptive, we are selecting against the moderate trait. And so we wind up with this kind of diversified or disrupted selection.